being with us here today. Our message today is um, centering upon the experience that God desires for his people. You know, there is, um, there is an experience that God wants us to have as we get ready to, um, to give the, the last message of hope to the world, the, the three angels message, which really is the everlasting gospel to the world. And um, in order for us to give this message, there's a certain experience that God wants us to enter into. Now, today we're going to talk about that in relation to um, God's people and in, in, uh, with uh, the remnant church. So um, as we go into this message, I would just uh, ask that we all um, continue to keep our hearts tuned into God and, and to and to listen for his voice speaking to us as we go into this message. Now, I'm gonna start with, um, you know, with the experience that I had uh, growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, there are two primary types of Adventists um, that, you know, in the world today. And one, those who were born a Seventh-day Adventist, those who had uh, their upbringing in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and those who have come into the Adventist church from various denominations, whether it's um, the Catholic church, the Protestant churches, maybe another religion, or straight off out of, uh, out of atheism. And so when I was born, or I was born a third generation Adventist. And uh, my grandmother, when she, right shortly after the war, there was a, an Adventist coal porter that was going around the island and had come, come to, I guess, their place that they were staying uh, up near Malolo. And he was uh, selling some of the various um, Adventist books. Uh, I'm pretty sure that he was probably selling the, the Desire of Ages, The Great Controversy. And uh, my grandmother, I think she, she either bought one of them, but she had asked him, she said, you know, she had told him that, uh, she was Catholic, but that she was interested in getting a Bible. And so um, he, you know, he sold her a Bible, and then she asked if, um, if there was someone that could um, help her understand the Bible. And so from what I'm told from my dad is that they had um, studied with her, and then sometime afterwards, her and my grandfather became Seventh-day Adventists. And so you know, that began um, in the, probably the, the late 40s, where my grandmother became, you know, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist. And, of course, my, my father was a, a Seventh-day Adventist. My mother came from, um, she was a, a first-generation Adventist. She, her, her mother, I don't know uh, what religion they were. I think they were, they may have been Protestant. But she went to an Adventist college, and um, she became an Adventist. She came out to Guam as a, as a missionary uh, because she was a nurse. Of course, met up with my father, and of course, um, they got married, and, you know, that's how I came into, into the picture. So I come from, a, from an Adventist background, but many others, you know, they don't necessarily have the same kind of background that I do. Now, at the time that my grandmother was um, learning about the Advent faith, learning what the Bible had to, had to say, um, the Trinity was not an official part of the Adventist doctrine, although there were sentiments um, of it were making their way into the church at that time. Now, as an Adventist, one of the hallmarks of being a Seventh-day Adventist really is, and one of the things that kind of separate us from the rest of the churches is the day that we worship on, is the Seventh-day Sabbath. And um, it's one of the first things that you, you learn as an Adventist, and it's one of the distinct marks of our church. I remember going through Sabbath school services, and one of the first memory verses, of course, other than John 3.16, that everybody um, seems to uh, be, are taught to memorize, which is a beautiful text to memorize, was the... Um, was the Sabbath commandment. You know, it comes in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And I'm sure that you know, many of us could probably recite it, you know, beginning with, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? And so 
you know, for, for many of us um, growing up in the Adventist faith or coming into the church, we recognize that the, the Seventh-day Sabbath is, you know, is really important, you know, to us as Seventh-day Adventists. Um, we, of course, keep Sabbath from sundown to sundown, uh, believing that, um, that the Sabbath begins at sunset and ends at the next day at sunset. So during this time, there are a number of things that we do, and there are a number of things that we don't do. And, you know, growing up into the church, it was kind of something that you, you just grew up with, something that was, um, seemed very natural. Although for those coming into the, um, into the church from, you know, other denominations, it might not be such, uh, um, you know, it might not be such second nature, something that you have to learn. But one of the things we learned as growing up is that one of the first things that we do, of course, we turn off the television, you know, when the Sabbath hour comes in. There's no playing, there's no swimming, there's no reading of non-religious materials, there's a lot of do not do's, do not do's on the Sabbath day, right? And the one thing that we could do, though, was eat and sleep. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I remember growing up is that we did, of course, you know, there was potlucks and uh, church gatherings, but then, of course, there was also sleeping, you know, or taking a nap in the afternoon. But what was supposed to be done was that we were supposed to, to worship, gather and worship. We were, we were to study our Bibles. We are to do community outreach, meaning to, to share um, our faith with those in the community. Or, you know, they used to call it uh, lay activities. Now, for many of us, lay activities has kind of changed from the times uh, when I was growing up. Lay activities used to mean we'd go out into the, um, into the um, community, we would hand out tracks. We would get, you know, get, try to figure out if there was interest and just basically share the love of God with them. Well, today, lay activities really becomes, you know, when, you know, after you're so, you're done with potluck and your belly is full of food, it's time to, to lay down and take a nap until, you know, pretty much most of the Sabbath hours are over. And so that's kind of what the lay activities has become, uh, at least, you know, for, for many of us, you know, uh, today. But growing up, I can remember that the Sabbath day was really a day of restrictions, um, a day where we could not do the normal things that we did in our life. And I can remember enjoying the Adventist or the sanctioned Adventist activities. Sometimes we would go on hikes. Other times we would do lay activities. Other times we would um, just gather together as a group and go out into nature and, and, to, and to learn more about God. Um, one of the things we also used to do, uh, remember, was Friday night vespers. And of course, then we would have uh, uh, Sabbath, you know, at the end of the Sabbath, we would have a closing vespers. Now, I always wondered, you know, I, I, I know what a vesper service is, but I always wanted to understand what did that word vespers mean and where did it come from? And what I found is, is that vespers really was a kind of a devotional uh, service that, that would be done at sundown, and it was practiced in uh, the Catholic Church, Protestant churches, and, and other churches, really as a way to, um, you know, to, I guess, tune your heart to the Lord, you know, at night, you know, from evening to evening. But I remember we used to do that, you know, quite a bit. Um, going to the, the Talifof West a church, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, as an adult, um, the church has really lost sight of, you know, Vesper service. Maybe that's just Guam, because I'm sure there's other places that continue to do it. Um, for us, of course, the main event, the very, the most important thing was going to church on, sa on the Sabbath, you know, making sure that you at least uh, attended the, the main service. Of course, there was the, the Sabbath school service that was, you know, begins in the, in the beginning, uh, starts at 930. You know, there's a you know, song service a little before then. We have a, a Sabbath school service and then um, a little break and then we move into, into the, the main service. And of course, you know, maybe this is my experience on Guam. Bob, you might tell me if there's something different, but potlucks is a real, you know, is a mainstay, you know, for, you know, for us in the church. And that's probably not just with Seventh-day Adventists, you know, eating food together and, and fellowshipping. It really is a, a good way to get to know each other and to praise the Lord and stuff. But um, Potlucks always seem to be a big part of the of the Adventist or the Sabbath experience. Of course, and then there was uh, 
doing various Adventist activities with our friends growing up. And of course, the Saturday night Vesper service and then social activities that happened afterwards. So I remember when the Aganya Heights Church was the old church. It wasn't the way it was set up now. It was actually the front of it faced um, the opposite road. So uh, I remember we would go up these stairs into the church and then on the right hand side, they had, um, I think, uh, basketball courts and volleyball courts. And, you know, we would, um, we would, you know, participate in all kinds of different activities, you know, after the sun had gone down. So those were, you know, there were times that I, I remember and they were, they were good times. But as I got older, you know, into my teens and then my early 20s, um, things began to change. The Vesper services were something I uh, usually didn't go to anymore. Um, when possible, I would uh, skip the, sa the Sabbath school service, and, um, but you know, I had to at least be there for the, for the Sabbath service, because I know my grandmother always stressed that it was important for us to be, you know, you know to go to church, and I wanted to make, you know, to make her happy, and, and we would go. Um, then, you know, of course, you know, you don't want to miss out on the potlucks, because <laughs> how else are you going to get fed? But after that, I began to look uh, forward more and more to the close of the Sabbath. Um, and when I could, you know, that's when I could do the things that I wanted to do without feeling this kind of sense of guilt. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, it's like, you know, if we did things that we weren't supposed to do on the Sabbath, there was always a sense of guilt that, oh, you know, oh, you did something that you shouldn't have done on the Sabbath. And, you know, there was always this kind of sense of guilt that you felt about breaking the Sabbath, you know, the Sabbath hours. And now coming back into the church, um, the Sabbath, you know, though enjoyable, um, became a, um, a, rig a rigid period of time where I had to lay aside the different things that we were doing, you know, to, uh, to try to keep the hours of the Sabbath holy. I remember, you know, getting off work, rushing to the store, trying to get into Payless and get the things that we needed to either for potluck or for whatever we needed for the home before uh, the, the Sabbath hours had come into being. And I remember going into, the, into Payless, and you'll see other Adventists doing this, the very same thing, right? And I, you know, I would get in there, I would get what we need, not trying to, to shop too much, because you know, there's a couple kinds of shopping. The first kind of shopping is you go in there and you kind of just browse each of the aisles. Okay, what do we need? And you're taking your time, and you've got, you've got time to, to make sure you get things. And that's what my wife and I usually do and when we go together. But when it's a Friday night or when the Sabbath is approaching, what we would, you know, I would always be rushing her, you know. And you know how, how ladies are. They, they really just kind of want to shop. And so I'm trying to rush her because I want to get out of there the Sabbath, you know, before the Sabbath closes. And so there have been times when we rush out, and I know that there's probably only 15 or 20 minutes left before the sun goes down. <laughs> and I see another... Uh, member of the Adventist church going in and rushing, trying to get what they need before the Sabbath closes. And so this became, you know, this has become the experience that we had as Seventh-day Adventists, you know, looking, you know, okay, sundown is at this time. So we wanted to make sure at the very least that we were at least out of the store and at least on our way back to, you know, the house. Now, in reality, you know, that's already too late. Um, but you know, there's all kinds of things that we're, you know, that we were not uh, supposed to do. And then, of course, getting up in the morning and getting ready for church was always, you know, a chore, especially when you have kids and you have family members and you're all trying to get out of there at a good time. Then there's the preparing of the, the, the meal that we're going to bring, whatever potluck dish or two or three that we do. And it really became, you know, an experience. It was like, you know, at, at many times it was stressful especially when, you know, if I was going to be participating in the Sabbath school service or if I was going to be participating in the, in the Sabbath service. So our, the experience that I had was, you know, was not always, you know, restful and peaceful. And I think that there was only a few times where I felt that one, that I was ready for the Sabbath when it came and that, um, and that when the Sabbath was leaving, that I, I truly had joy in my heart and I didn't, you know, and didn't want to see the, the Sabbath go. But, you know, because of life, you know, the experience that we a lot of times have is keeping the hours of the Sabbath holy 
really become, can become a chore. So what is the result of this experience that we, you know, as Seventh-day Adventists, go through? Because, you know, we look at the Sabbath as a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's a time that we're trying to, to uh, spend with the Lord. But in order to spend time with the Lord, there's don't do this or do this or get ready for this. And it just, you know, can get kind of, um, kind of complicated. And um, so the, the experience is, is that secretly we become judgmental because we're judging ourselves based upon what we're doing for the Sabbath. And then when we are, you know, let's say in church, let's say we, we got everybody together on time, we got to church on time, we got there for the song service, and then we see people come in. So really, uh, like for the church that I was going to, the, the song service, it was very sparsely populated. We didn't have very many people in the church at the time. And as we got closer and closer to the, um, to the divine service, the church would become more and more and more people. And as we look around, you know, and maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, we're kind of, you know, we kind of judge people. Oh, you know, so-and-so comes in late. Oh, they're always late or something like this. Or we look at, you know, what they're wearing, you know, or, or, or whatnot. We come a, a bit judgmental um, because, you know, we're, you know, it's just kind of the way we become because we're, we treat the Sabbath as it is an obligation rather than a joy. Yeah, and, and, and like Esther was just saying, it's, it's that in, in other churches, in, in the Catholic Church as well. And so primarily, our experience is, you know, becomes, instead of one of joy, it becomes one of obligation. And one of the things that, you know, that, you know, we do note is that when the offering basket goes around, we kind of look who's giving and who's not giving, right? And it's maybe not, you know, uh, overtly, but it's still something that we register. You know, are they putting in a tithe envelope or not? And, you know, and, you know, one of the things that I know that we wanted to do is we wanted to also always make sure that we put money in. And so we'd give a couple dollars to our kids, you know, so they can, you know, put money in. And we always made sure that we put in, you know, our um, contribution to the church. But, you know, you have to ask yourself sometime, you know, really, you know, why are we doing the things that we do? I mean, if this really becomes an obligation. And if we're honest, we're all to, you know, we do this, and all of us do this or did this uh, to one degree or another. So why, why do we do this? To make ourselves feel better about ourselves when we look to other people and we see that they're coming in late, but that, you know, we're not late or they're later than we are. Um, sometimes we, we tend to look at other people and, and vicariously judge them uh, according to whatever standards that we have uh, placed upon ourselves. And somehow when we see people coming in later than we are that maybe didn't give an offering or, you know, didn't participate in the service, somehow we feel better about ourselves. Now, this may not be the experience of everyone. There may be um, others that, you know, they're probably thinking that I'm crazy. But, I mean, to one degree or another, we, we've gone through this at least at one time. But we find in the Bible, in the, in the Word of God, a text from the book of 2 Corinthians, when it talks about um, these kinds of things, when it talks about us comparing ourselves with one another. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measure themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, the Bible says, are not wise. And so I say, you know what, I want something a little bit clearer. And so what was Paul actually trying to say to the Corinthians? And so when you look at the New Living Translation, it says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these men who tell you how important they are. But notice how it says this in the New Living Translation. It says, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. And then and it's a translated, how ignorant. And you know, there are many times that we do this, maybe not consciously, but maybe subconsciously, is that we look to others, maybe in the church or not in the church, and we, we tend to compare ourselves with other people. Um, and based upon their condition or their perceived condition, we think ourselves 
you know, actually pretty good. So all of us can seem pretty good when we compare ourselves with someone that is not um, in the same place as us. But the Bible is saying when we do that, we are not wise. And so the message that we're talking about today is what is the experience that God desires for his people to have? Does God want us to look to the Sabbath as something of an obligation? Or are we to look to it as something that we are to participate in with joy, you know, and looking forward to? And, um, and when the Sabbath hours are gone, you know, you know he, it's, it's something that we look, you know, that we're not happy about, but that we look forward to come to the next, you know, the next day or the next week. And so, you know, the Sabbath experience for an Adventist is, you know, is a big part of what makes us the Seventh-day Adventist. Now, uh, one of the other things that makes us the Seventh-day Adventist is um, the spirit of prophecy or evangelistic meetings or prophecy seminars. So that is one of the hallmarks of Adventists is Bible prophecy. So the vast majority of Adventists have been to one or more evangelistic meetings. Now, if I asked everybody out here, I guarantee you, if I said, how many of you have been to more than one evangelistic meeting? I guarantee you, everyone is going to raise their hand and say yes, right? And so I see people smiling because they know that this is true. Um, if you grew up in the Adventist church, you have been through many, many, many uh, meetings. But if you just come into the church, you know, you've at least been to one. Usually is because that one meeting that you went to is where you gave your heart to the Lord and became a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so for an Adventist, you know, Bible prophecy seminars is something that we take pride in. Um, so... Prophecy is the primary means. So these evangelistic meetings are the primary means by which the Adventist uh, church grows and new members are brought into the church. Now, there's, of course, a science to it. Um, there's a method to it, to where um, what is supposed to happen is that in an area that you're supposed to be doing, uh, you're going to have an evangelistic meeting. You have people go out and they gauge the interest of people. They start having Bible studies with people and they start to sharing with them the word of God and um, the doctrines of the church. And you start to show them, you know, uh, things in the Bible or the truths that are in the Bible. So that when the evangelist meeting comes, we bring them to these meetings and then they, you know, are pretty much ready to be baptized and to, uh, to become a member of the Adventist church. And so for many of us as Adventists, you know, we, we kind of take pride in our um, prophecy meetings because, I mean, you know, really, God has given us the spirit of prophecy. He has given us an understanding of Bible prophecy that is on a par, is not on par with anybody else. Uh, if you've looked or listened to any of the Protestant churches or, you know, whatever churches and they're talking about the future or about prophecy, you can see many holes in their understanding of prophecy. And so as Adventists, we have this pride, and, and maybe it's not pride, it could just be confidence that we believe that we understand prophecy and what it means and what it's pointing forward to, because we actually had a, a, um, a recent prophet of God that you know, gave us this information that led us into the past you know, of truth. And so, um, you know, I remember growing up in, uh, in the church, I went to many prophecy seminars, you know, and probably more than I can actually remember. But I, I remember I enjoyed them. And um, later on, you know, when I came back to the church, it was a way for me to get reconnected with my roots and to get um, connected with what my parents had taught me growing up. But after a while, the, you know, the, the meetings start to lose their hold upon us. Um, you know, we can, we can pretty much tell you the, the topics that they're gonna hit um, at pretty much every evangelistic meeting. If it's a long set of meetings, they're gonna hit pretty much all of the, all of the topics. You know, they're gonna talk about um, the, the last days. You know, they're gonna talk about the second coming, the mark of the beast. They're gonna talk about um, the beasts of Revelation. They're gonna talk about Daniel chapter two. So you, you know, pretty much the topics that they're going to talk about. And, you know, the funny thing is, is that every evangelistic meeting takes these um, prophecy meetings and they put a spin on the title. 
somehow to try to entice the people to come in without actually telling them the exactly what it's about. And so, you know, you get colorful um, interpretations of um, the different subject matters because they know that people have heard these messages in an area before and they're trying to pique their interest. But one of the things I realize is that after a while, understanding prophecy loses its hold upon you. You know, you may come in and you're, you're intrigued because the truths that are being um, shared in these meetings are, um, you know, they, they seem fresh and new and they just make so much sense and there's so much biblical evidence to support what the, the speaker is saying. And in a lot of ways, there is an emotional um, component to it that, you know, that, that leads someone into, uh, to make an emotional decision. Now, what is the primary measure of the success of a, an evangelistic meeting? Well, there's two primary uh, measures that they look at. First measure that they look at is how many people are coming to the meetings. And then after that is how many baptisms are, you know, are, gonna, are, uh, are happening as a result of it. Now, now, those are the two primary measures. Now, one in particular that I remember um, that here on Guam, I think happened, I believe it was in 2002. How many of you remember um, the Kenneth Cox meetings that happened um, in early 2000? Okay, Go, a show of hands. Anybody? Okay, some of you, you remember it. And, um, you know, there, there was, um, it, it was a wonderful set of meetings. And I remember that there was a discussion, you know, about, you know, because they, they, they decided to, they decided to give it to the Lord. They decided to um, just go all out and spend whatever it took. And I know that they spent well over a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for this meeting, buying flyers, um, doing advertisements. Um, and, you know, it's costly to bring in one of these Adventist evangelists, right? Because you're not just bringing in the evangelists, you're bringing in all of their people and they're coming in and they're spending weeks here. And then, of course, we rented out the, um, the UOG Fieldhouse. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is, is that there was so many people that were coming to these meetings, and there was so much interest in the messages that were speaking. Now, I will say that Kenneth Cox did a, a fantastic job. You know, he really had a, a firm understanding of, of prophecy and the Bible and the doctrines of the church. And, and you know, frankly, he was a very good presenter. Okay, and so with that, there was a lot of interest that was was um, was generated, and you know, so I was involved in I don't know different levels of the local church. You know, at the time, I can't I think I was at you know, of course at the Talafofo Church, um, and one of the things that they started talking about was baptisms. Okay, they were you know they 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 had a lot of people that were studying for baptisms and. Uh, there were so many baptisms that they had to they had to do the baptisms over um, several I think two or three weeks where they you know each Sabbath they had a, a large number of people that were baptized and I think through it there was uh, between two and three hundred people that were baptized and that was was coming into the church now this of course was was wonderful news to you know to you know to the church and to the leadership uh, but what was a little disappointing was they were starting to see uh, something that I didn't recognize that they were seeing, and it didn't uh, dawn on me, you know, really what their focus was, is they started to think about tithing and offerings and the, and the amount of money that was going to be coming into the church because all of these extra people were supposed to be coming in. And um, one of the things that they were talking about was how, how are we going to get these people? What churches are they going to go to? And so there was a, there was a plan put in place to try to, uh, try to divvy out where do these people are going to to go to church, and they were thinking about GAA and how many people would be coming into the uh, to GAA, and they were thinking about the numbers of GAA swelling and and all of these kinds of things. Now, you know, those are all fine and and, and good things, you know, because we certainly want people to come into to God's church, but the focus, you know, kind of was away from the salvation of others. Um, and focusing more about just getting in numbers. Well, when all the dust had settled, the vast majority of the people that had accepted Christ and had given their hearts to the Lord 
most of them within a very short period of time were no longer to be found within the church. In fact, there are some of the peoples that were being baptized didn't recognize or even realize that they were being brought into a denomination. They hadn't really been covering these things. They were so interested in just getting numbers that they lost sight of the fact that they were bringing these people into a church, into a denomination, into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so it's no, it's no um, secret that one of the things we as, as Adventists know is that as, as many as we that come in the front door, there are many that leave through the back door. And so it, you know, the, the, for, for many of us, we see that it's hard to retain people within the church. Um, one of the things that we do as, um, as, um, as Adventists is that um, we are supposed to, really as, as children of God, we're supposed to introduce people to Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons why for me, in my experience, that I started to lose um, interest in the prophecy seminars is because all they did was focus on prophecy. Prophecy, prophecy, prophecy. And it was missing something. And I didn't recognize was, what that was until, until I actually, um, until I came out of the church. And what it was missing was a focus and center upon Jesus Christ. Now, there is, um, there is a text in the book of Second Peter, and I'm going to ask my brother um, Romy, if you will, to open your Bible, unmute yourself, and read Second uh, Peter chapter one, verse nineteen, because you know prophecy is important. It has its place within the church. God gave it to us for a reason, but prophecy is not the end result. Prophecy doesn't save us. Prophecy doesn't keep people in the church. And so I'm going to ask my brother to go ahead and read. Second Peter chapter one verse nineteen. Uh, Second Peter chapter one verse nineteen says, "We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts." Amen. So when we when we look at that verse it's telling us is that prophecy is something that we need to heed. Prophecy is something that we're supposed to be doing. And, but it says then, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And so you say, what is that day star? What is that um, that is supposed to arise in our hearts? And so I looked at the New Living Translation, and that part of the verse says this. It says, until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. And so really, the, the whole purpose of prophecy is to bring people into connection with Jesus Christ. And, you know, for me, that is, um, that is really what has been missing in the experience that I had in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, I see uh, that Mike or Marie has uh, their hand raised. Is there something that you would like to ask or share, uh, brother or sister? No, it was just because when you were asking those questions about like who attended the evangelistic uh, Cox, uh, Kenneth yeah. Fox, and all that, so that's how we raised our hands. Yay, amen. You're right. Yeah. So, I mean, that was that was a, a nice set of meetings. I, I certainly appreciated. So, for for Adventists, you know, uh, we have we seem to have lost sight of the the purpose of Bible prophecy. Uh, is that it's to lead people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, many of you may have, um, um, when, you're, when you have come into the church, you know, my wife, she came into the church from an evangelistic meeting. She came into the, into the church in a meeting that I had been given. And that was um, really a, a, a big blessing, you know, for me and to, for, for our family when she had done that. And so, you know, certainly Bible prophecy seminars have their, their purpose. And so as you um, got ready for baptism, um, I can, I'm sure that all of you had to go through, to one degree or another, the fundamental beliefs of the church. Now, in the baptismal classes, they, they kind of um, group them together. So one topic could cover, you know, two or three uh, principles of the, um, of the Adventist church. 
And so you learn the fundamental principles of the church. So that's one of the first things that are taught. And uh, the most prominent of which is um, who God is. Okay, we, we learn about who God is. Uh, the doctrine is one of the most important parts of becoming an Adventist. So as you come into the Adventist church, you learn uh, about what the church believes. And of course, you have to attest prior to your baptism that you, um, that you believe and will adhere to the, um, the doctrines of the Adventist church. And of course, these are outlined in more full detail in the 28 fundamental beliefs. But you know, one of the things that you learn of is the Ten Commandments. What is the, you know, what, what is the place of the law? We start to learn more about the health message, uh, the second coming of Christ, the sanctuary, and the investigative judgment, and, you know, all of those different um, beliefs and understandings within the church. This leads the believer. Now, when you, when, you, when you learn about what the fundamental beliefs are of the church, as good as they are, they lead you into a certain kind of experience. Okay, it leads you into an experience of or into an experience with the written word of God. So you start to look to the written word of God as you know, in a way that you probably haven't before. So, you know, rather not just when I talk about the word, I'm, when I says the written word, I'm not talking about Jesus Christ, the word. I'm talking about the written word of God, um, memorizing memory texts and, and reading through the Bible and understanding what the Bible says. Now, none of this is a bad thing, but if that's the only thing that we focus on, then our relationship is going to be with the written word of God. When God wants us to move into a, a closer experience with him. So when we focus on doctrines of the church, fundamental beliefs, Bible prophecy, and what the church has to say about this verse or that verse, we tend to enter into a relationship with the Word of God. We, and we enter into a relationship with the church itself and with the, uh, with the law and with Bible prophecy. And of course, what, um, if we have a relationship with, uh, with uh, prophecy, we also have a relationship with the spirit of prophecy, which, you know, with Ellen White and her writings. And uh, many times we, we hold the spirit of prophecy up to, uh, to a higher standard sometimes in the Bible. And so um, the whole point that I guess I'm trying to make here is that God is trying to, to lead us into a closer experience. Now, at one time, this was acceptable unto God. This is how God spoke to his people. So um, the early experience of Seventh-day Adventists um, is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, or chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And so we're going to just read through that real quickly. So I'm going to ask um, um, Kathy and Bob, if you will, get ready to, to read um, Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. And so, Kathy, I'm going to have you read the first, um, let's see, the first few verses. Let's have you read um, through verse 10. And Bob, you read... Um, 11 through 13. Chapter 3. Okay, so you want me to read 3 uh, verses what? 7 through 10. 7 through 10. Yeah. Okay, Revelation 3, 7 through 10. <laughs> and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that is that is the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, but are not and do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept my word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptations, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Bob, if you can unmute yourself and read 11 through 13. 
Saw your lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man taketh thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall no more go out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of his city, the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down from out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Thank you, brother. So what this is telling us here, and we're not going to get into a deep dive because this message is really not about um, dissecting and understanding fully, you know, what the message is to this church of Philadelphia. But one of the things that you're going to notice here is that this message, of course, comes from Jesus himself. It's if most of you have red letter edition Bibles, you're seeing that it's written in red. So this message comes from Jesus, right? And he is, he is, he is, uh, he is talking to this church. Now, this is the, the beginning of the Advent movement. This is the time um, uh, of the church in its infancy, before it actually became and called the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice is that, um, unlike some of the other churches, there's nothing that he calls out about this church that is wrong, okay? Is that this is considered to be the pure church of Philadelphia. All he has is commendation or praise for the church. And notice that it says in verse 11, um, uh, it says, um, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. And so he's saying, hold fast to that which you have. And then he says uh, in verse 8, it says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and notice this, and has kept my word and has not denied my name. And so really what this is talking about here is that this is the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist church. And this is really um, kind of the, the focus of what I'm trying to, to, to relay in this message today is that experience that God desires for his people to have. I fully believe that the Seventh-day Adventist movement was orchestrated and led by God. And during this time, during this church of Philadelphia, the, they were doing pretty much the same things that we are doing today. They were, they, 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 they were understanding the Bible and its doctrine. They were following the law of God. They were, you know, they were learning and understanding and sharing about Bible prophecy. They had evangelistic meetings like we have today. And, uh, you know, all of the things that they were doing, they were paying their tithe, right? They were um, going to church. They were keeping the hours of the Sabbath holy, right? And so all of these things that they were doing, they were doing because they were led by God, because God was speaking to them through the Bible. He was speaking to them through Ellen White, the prophet of God. And so that is how God was speaking to the church at this time. And because they were doing all that God had, had um, told them to do, they were, uh, there, was no, there, was no, um, there was nothing bad found within them. It says, um, you know, he says he knows their works. And he says he will keep them from the hour of temptation that is to come. Now, interestingly enough, the, the, the church didn't, you know, uh, has changed from there. It is no longer the church, the pure church of um, Philadelphia, but it has become the corrupt church of Laodicea. Now, we're going to read real quickly, and we're and like this, um, the, the Church of Philadelphia, we're not going to get into a deep dive into what all of these things mean. Because the main thing that I'm trying to bring out here is the experience that God wants for his people is, um, is different uh, in the time of Philadelphia until the time of today. God wants us in a different experience than he had in the past. And so I'm going to ask... Um, um, Sister Darlene and Brother um, Romy, if you will, to, to read Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And so I'm going to ask Darlene to read first, and I'm going to have you read 14 through 17. And Romy, I'm going to have you read 18 through 21. Okay. 
And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Okay, Brother Romy. You have to unmute yourself. And uh, 18 through 21. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy heart that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, and open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. In verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and then sit down with my father in his throne. And just read the last verse, 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the church. Amen. Thank you, my brother and sister, for, for reading that. Now, really, like I said, I'm not, we're not going to dive deep into what this actually, you know, all of the, the nuances of what this means. But, you know, you can certainly tell that there's a stark contrast between the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Laodicea, right? The Church of Philadelphia was a pure church. There was no admonition, nothing that God wanted to, or that Jesus wanted to call out and say, there's a problem with this or a problem with that. Um, in this church, God calls out only things that are wrong with the church. There's nothing commendable about this church. Now, the interesting thing is, is that this is the Seventh-day Adventist church from the time of Philadelphia is now the church of Laodicea. This is the same church, the same, um, same belief system. Now, uh, one of the things that you notice is, is that while the one is pure, this one is wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And, um, and, and they are blind to their condition before God. But notice something here, is that in the time of, of Ellen White, they were doing all the things that they're doing today. Today, they're, they're doing evangelistic meetings. They are um, they're going to church and keeping the seventh-day Sabbath. They're... Um, you know, they're paying their tithe. They're, they're doing all the things that the law requires, right? So what is the difference between these two churches? Wes? Yes, sir. James White declared this church to be in the land of Laodicea when he was still alive. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So about what time was that? Well, it had to be in the 1800s. Okay. So the, the beginning of the Adventist movement, you know, was, was a time of a pure church. They were doing the same things that they are doing today, right? What made the difference? And that's really the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to focus on is what made the difference. Now, in the past, I have said that the difference was that the God that they worship, and to a large degree, that's true. But there's something deeper that we need to understand. Why is it and how is it that the God that they were worshiping in the time of Ellen White changed to the God that they're worshiping today. Now, we're not going to focus so much upon that because that's, you know, kind of, um, you know, we've talked about that quite a bit. But what I want to focus on is this, is that they were doing the same things in the time of Ellen White as they are doing today. One church was considered a pure church and one considered a, a corrupt church or a wretched church, right, with nothing good in it, okay? So that's what I want to look at. Why do we have this contrast? How did this contrast come to be? Well, I'd like you to turn, if you will, to the, um, um, the book of John, chapter uh, 1, and, and we're going to read verses 12 through 17. So John chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And I'm just, you know, for expedience, 
I'll go ahead and, uh, and read that. So in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which was born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And of course, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 14, it says, And the word, talking about the Son of God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. Now, notice verse 17, and this is kind of the focus that I wanted us to look at is, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, this is talking about the beginning of the apostolic church, is that before Christ had come, the, the people were under the governance of the law. They were under the, you know, they were, God spoke to them through the prophets, which were then written down and recorded, in the in the Old Testament, and they were um, they were under a system of laws. And during this time, the people were either righteous or unrighteous based upon their keeping of the law of God or not. Okay, and 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 for that time, that was acceptable unto God, right? And I know that somewhere in the Bible it says that it it was their righteousness. Okay. But the time had come when Jesus was to be given. It says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Talking about something that was greater that was given. And so, um, you know, so from the time of the apostolic church had been corrupted, or, or, you know, during the time of the apostolic church is when Christ manifested himself upon his people. The time of Pentecost. Um, Christ was given to his church in such a large measure that they were filled with his spirit. And what was it that they did? They went to those um, in the Jewish community and they spoke in tongues and the spirit of Christ was upon them. And many were pricked at the heart and they said, what must we do? And, in, and Paul or Peter says unto them, he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus. And so, so the spirit of Christ had come into the church this time. No longer was it uh, to be part of the system of laws and rules and regulations, and sacrifices and ceremony. It was to be Christ living within the church. And that is what spread Christianity to all parts of the world. But of course, we know what had happened is that the um, um, Satan had infiltrated the church and had corrupted the church, and it had become um, the, the Church of Rome. It had become um, the corrupt church. But notice this, is that from the time of the Reformation all the way up into the time of the Advent movement, God was leading his people back away from the corruption that had come into the church, and he was leading them step by step. We see that the, the Reformation happened or in the 1600s, right? And it continued on until the Advent movement began in the 1830s and 1840s. And so this was the beginning of the, of the purification of the church and that the, the Advent movement had been keeping the word of God and had been faithful to what they had been shown all the way up until that point in time. But like the time when Christ had come and he was to pour out his spirit upon the church, there was a change in how God was going to relate with his people. And so we find this in our opening text in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So I'd ask you, if you will, let's turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And so I'm going to go ahead and just read that for you. Um, so Hebrews chapter 1 says this. Now notice it. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, when you think about this, how did he speak to them by the prophets? Well, when he spoke to them through the prophets, the prophets would, would speak to the people, would speak to the leaders, and they would follow the direction. Now, when the prophet had died, of course, they had, you know, the prophet had recorded 
through the pen of inspiration. And that's how the Old Testament had begun to be written. And so the voice of the prophets continued on for, you know, even past their death. And so God spoke to them through the word of God, which is really was through the prophets, right? So God, in when sundry times and in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers, basically unto those, um, our forefathers, by the prophets. Now, notice this in verse 2. It says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And so there was a change in the way that God was communicating with his people. There was a change in, how, in, in where God was in relation to his people. In the time before Christ, he was in a sanctuary. He was, he was embodied in rules and ceremonies, and uh, he was shrouded with, um, with rites and rituals, right? And that's what we see in the sanctuary service. That's what we see in the law. And as long as people were following to the best that they could the law of God, they were um, at peace with God. But notice this. When Christ came, there was a change in how God was speaking and dealing with his people. And now he's speaking to them by his son. And so Christ then, uh, being given to the church, spoke through the church. But because of the apostasy of the church, that form of communication was no longer how God was able to speak to his people. He, they were so separated that he then had to go back and speak to them by the prophets, right? By the word of God. This is what was happening during the, during the time of Ellen White. And then Ellen White herself it was a prophet of God because God was speaking to this group of people, these Seventh-day Adventists, through Ellen White and through um, the word of God, through the laws, right? You know, through keeping, you know, through a system of rules and regulations. But my friends, that's not what God wants. God wants us to enter into a closer relationship with him. He wants us to, he wants to live within us. And so God was ready with the Adventist church at that time, in the time of 1888, to move into a closer relationship with his people. And that's why that message, and we've talked about this a little bit in the past, the message of righteousness by faith came to be. And Jones and Wagner had given this message. And Ellen White herself, because God had not shown her directly this message of righteousness by faith in the way that God had revealed it to Jones and Wagner. Because she had said is that when she heard this message of righteousness by faith, when she heard um, how Christ was to be living within them, she said her heart burned within her because the, the message that she was hearing resonated with her soul. And this is the message that she was trying to get to the people. But unfortunately, the church had rejected this message. They had rejected the message of righteousness by faith. They rejected Christ coming into them and speaking to them through the indwelling of the Spirit of Christ within their hearts. Now, think about this. If they have rejected Christ coming in, if God is moving into another direction, he's going to speak to them in another manner. Let's say he's changing the channel. And if they don't change the channel with him, if they don't allow him into their hearts, then what do they have left? Is they have the word of God. They have the words of the prophets in the way that God used to communicate to them. God is no longer communicating to them, to the people of God, through the written word of God. Now, I'm not saying that there's no value in the written word of God, because that's not true. God has reached many people through the written word, but God is speaking to us today by his son. The word of God becomes alive when we recognize that Jesus Christ is the son of God and he's living within us. Then when we read his word, we are connected with God. But God was moving in his way of speaking to his people. And because the church did not move along with him, and I'm, think, I'm talking about the church as an organization, God no longer was speaking to them through those channels anymore. Yes, they had the, the words of the prophets. They had the words of Ellen White. But they were not the same as God, what the experience that God wanted for them. Now, how does this relate to the condition that we find the church in today? Why does Jesus say that this group of people is wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? The Trinity came in only after 
they rejected Jesus coming into their hearts. And when, and, and when, they, when Christ was rejected, then gave way for a false doctrine to come into the church. Now was Satan's opportunity to bring in. While the prophet of God was still alive, right, from 1888 all the way through 1950, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity tried to come into the church, but because God was still speaking through Ellen White at that time, she was still a prophet of God. She was able to identify it and warn the people against it. But once she passed away, and once the pioneers began to pass away, the doctrine of the Trinity began to come into the church. And so, my friends, the, 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 the Adventist church has become like the Jews of old. After Christ had come and he had given his sacrifice, no longer were those, those ceremonies or their system of worship um, acceptable unto God because it, it, it pointed forward to something that had already happened. In the same way, the Adventist church has fought, gone the same way as the Jews. They're following the same ways that the pioneers had done in the past, but because they neglected to move with God in how he communicates with them, these, it, everything has become shallow. It has become empty. That's why prophecy, the prophecy seminars, they, they, they don't have the same power as they did in the past. It's because it's not focused upon Jesus Christ. And so simply all I'm trying to say is this, is that God loves his people. God is still reaching out for those that are in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Absolutely, because we find in Revelation chapter 3, and I believe it's in verse um, 19, it says, as many as I love. So he's, he's telling this group of people, he's telling his people, he says, I love you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, I discipline. And then he says in verse 20, it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. See, God wants to speak to his people through Jesus. Jesus is on the outside seeking to gain entrance into the heart of his people so he can bring them into that experience that God wants them to be in. He's pleading with them. He says, behold, I'm standing at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. My friends, God wants to come into our hearts. He wants to come into the hearts of his people that he loves so very much. But the people have been blinded. The people are rejecting him. And my friends, it is, it is for us who are connected with Jesus Christ, who is Christ is living within us. It is for us to reach out to these, our brothers and sisters in the church, and to say that, that the Lord wants to come into their hearts. God, who in sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto our fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God wants a people. He wants his people to open the doors of their hearts and let him in. Then the word of God becomes a new book. Our Sabbath keeping becomes renewed and refreshed because Christ is in us. My friends, that's what it's all about. It's not a, it's not a message of trying to tear down uh, the church or anything. It's, it's trying to open their eyes to the reality that God is not speaking to them through prophecy anymore. He's not speaking to them by Ellen White. He doesn't want to speak to them by the written word. He wants to speak with them directly by Christ living within them. My friends, that's really, that's the message to the, the, the church, and that's the message that is to go to the world. And my friends, that's, that's what God wants. He wants us to be in that closer room. I mean, that's why he said, he said um, in, um, in John chapter 14, right before Jesus was, you know, before he was leaving his disciples, says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He's saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare you to be with God. He says, 
in verse um, four, he says, verse three, and if I go to prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. My friends, God wants us to be with him. He wants us in that relationship with him. And when Christ is living within us, my friends, we can go to the whole world and share as a witness what God has done with us. And if God can do that for us, he can do that for everyone else that would just accept him as their savior. And so my friends, that's really the message that God has um, laid upon my heart today. It's not a message to, to tear down the Adventist church. It's not a message to, to, to demean our brothers and sisters. It's a message of hope. It's a message of love. It's a message that God wants them to receive. And so my friends, that's really what we need to do today. Does anybody have anything that you would like to share, anything you would like to add, or even any questions that you might have about um, the message that we just went through today? All right. Yes, it's a message of turning back around to Jesus Christ to listen to his voice. For he was the one whom God has appointed to deliver his message to his people. And so this is the message that he has given uh, to them uh, in the early years of Adventism, but uh, they have turned back later on uh, in the years to come. They have uh, turned back. They have turned around their backs uh, upon a different uh, uh, doctrine, upon a, a different standard of learning, which became so imminent in the organization that until uh, uh, their, their standard of uh, learning became apostatized and uh, truly that's what we have been uh, seeing even up to now that God's people were being uh, diverted into a different kind of doctrine. That's why uh, the call to the Laodiceans is a call to, for repentance and to turn back around and listen once again to the voice of Jesus Christ who is uh, calling us to listen to him and uh, be in a loving relationship. That's what the word, the word Philadelphia means. It's love. It's a church. It's a people of love for God and for Jesus Christ. And in the message to the Laodiceans, it became so different. That's why Christ is calling patiently, urging his people to come back. Amen, my brother. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's absolutely right. God loves his people, but he wants them to enter into that closer relationship with him. All right. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share? All right. Okay, with that, we'll um, move to our, um, our closing Can hymn. I Go ahead. Can I just say, yeah, um, it's, a, it's something that Ellen G. White wrote, but it's not, um, it came out of the Revelation um, chapter 3, 14 through 21, 22 that we read, but uh -huh. it's a different meaning, a different topic from what you were teaching, but okay. this, what I'm going to read, um, is applies to a couple of us who we talk among each other, and I think this also speaks to some of us right now and i just want to read this from ellen g white uh 
specifically on Revelation 3, chapter, um, chapter 3, verse 19. Ellen G. Wright says, Thank you, Lord, for my trials. But when tribulation comes upon us, how many of us are like Jacob? We think in the hand of an enemy, and in the darkness we wrestle blindly until our strength is spent, and we find no comfort or deliverance. Like Jacob, he also needs to learn that trials mean benefit, and not to despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when we are rebuked of him. Happy is the man who God corrected. And that's from Job 5.17. Amen. So it, uh, yeah, we're talking about, you know, the trials we're going through. So I, I thought this really speaks to some of us right now. Amen. Thank you, sister, for sharing. All right. Yeah, that's, that's why it's a call to turn back to Christ. Uh, because he's the only one who has the power and authority to uh, change us, to bring us back into a right relationship with God and no other way. We need to wrestle with ourselves and to deny self and to trust fully in Christ, to entrust our lives fully to Christ so that he can do the work of sanctification, do the work of uh, making us upright with God. That's the only way. It's the same thing with uh, Jacob. He wrestled with God. He actually wrestled with Jesus Christ at that time. And uh, he became triumphant, not because he was strong, but it actually... Uh, bring out that uh, Jesus Christ, he wrestled with Jesus Christ, meaning that he, he entrusts his life to Jesus Christ, to the power of the Son of God. And so he was brought back into a right uh, relationship with God because of the power of the Son of God in him when he wrestled with him. And that's, it's the same thing with us. Uh, that's why the Apostle Paul says that uh, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, and uh, but against uh, spiritual principalities in darkness. So it's only Jesus Christ who can uh, make us victorious and triumphant against this uh, power of darkness. No other way around. No other else. So if we and trust fully our life to him then we can truly become victorious but oftentimes we are so proud to say that we are strong just like the Laodiceans say there's nothing wrong with us there's nothing wrong with me I'm uh, I have all the the providences in life that I need so I don't need anything uh, more, but uh, he doesn't recognize his, his spiritual deficiency in life. That is the most important thing. It's not about material things. It's about spiritual things that we need to look upon. And it is only Jesus Christ that can be able to become victorious in our life. That's why he's pointing us the Laodiceans, uh, to himself, not to ourselves. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, brother and sisters and everybody for sharing. So we're going to go ahead and close our, our message today, and we're going to um, sing our closing hymn. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone um, as we go ahead and, uh, and we sing. Open my eyes that I may see 
glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Um, let's bow our heads um, for prayer. Our kind and loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to be with us, Father. I pray that you will continue to fill us with your spirit. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Father, and fit us and, you know, for heaven. I pray that you will continue to work upon our hearts, that we may share this wonderful truth that God is trying to share with, um, with his people, Father that they may open their eyes, that they may see the wonderful truth that Jesus is the Son of God and that he desires to come into their hearts and speak to them and commune with them directly. Bless us as we depart our ways, but do not depart from us, uh, from our presence, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.